Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this beautiful sunny day without a cloud in the sky where I am. Glorious sunshine and the promise of resurrection. Our call to worship this morning is, uh, is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Let us worship God. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, Go therefore and be disciples, disciples of all nations. nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, remember I, I am with I you always, always to the end of the age. Let us pray together. Almighty God, God with joy, with joy and, and all, we praise, praise you for claiming us, claiming us as your as sons and daughters. And and for pouring and for your, your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit upon us. Shine your Shine light on all your all faithful, children, faithful children for the sake for the of the one, of the one whose birth whose and baptism, baptism is renewed and transformation, transformation. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All righty. Our first hymn, ah, what happened to my second hymn, is um, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Getting there, getting there.
Let us draw near to God with sincerity of heart and full assurance of faith, our guilty hearts sprinkled clean, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us confess before our God, praying, merciful God, in baptism, you promise forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from sisters and brothers in Christ. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us hostage. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Remind us of the promises you make in baptism so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. Make us new people. Hear the good news. In baptism, you were buried with Christ. In baptism also, you were raised to life with him through faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let us pray together the prayer for illumination printed in the bulletin. And let me find that. Here we are. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, the one who hovered over the waters at creation's birth, who descended in the form of a dove at Jesus' baptism, who was poured out under the signs of fire and wind at Pentecost, come to us, open our hearts and minds so that we may hear the word of life and be renewed by your power. For you live and reign with the Father and the Son, now and forever. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This is the story of Jesus' baptism. In those days... Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. I had considered throwing out my plans for today's sermon after watching TV all day Wednesday afternoon and on into the evening. I was really kind of at sea about what to do today. 
And a lot of preacher friends that I have on social media were asking if anyone else was ripping up sermons and starting over. And I said, well, not me, because I usually don't put anything down until Saturday anyway. So by the time I got around to actually putting something together, knitting together all of the stuff that happened this week and the things that I had read about this passage, I decided to go ahead and stick with this text, but maybe with a different perspective driven out of our nation's politics. Now, I don't know how any of you voted this last November. And frankly, I don't need to know. I don't want to know. I have some guesses. <laughs> and some of you have made your political affiliation pretty clear to me over the last 11 years that we've been together. But those are personal decisions that you make with your own conscience. Now, to be sure, your personal choice, whoever you choose when you go into that voting booth, has public implications, which is what participating in democracy is all about. And that, the vote, the capacity for individual citizens to weigh decisions, to go in and say, this is where I stand in the voting booth is something that we as a nation have always prided ourselves on. And I need to say this, I am proud to be an American. Even now I can say that because I have always been proud of our ability to look forward proud of our can-do attitude. Now think of it, two bicycle shop owners in Dayton, Ohio showed us we can fly. And then about 60 years later, we put another guy from Ohio on the moon because we could. We are a people with vision for what can be. but we are also a people with selective vision. In order to look forward, we have often ignored what's around us and forgotten what's behind us. We've seen what we want to, and we have looked away from that which causes us discomfort. While we have been able to see we haven't always seen clearly or entirely. I've worn corrective lenses since I was in the sixth grade. I didn't know I was going to need them. And one day I was having trouble seeing what the teacher had written on the chalkboard. And since my family name starts with W, I was seated toward the back of the room because in those days they seated people alphabetically. And so I was in the back of the room and I was sitting there squinting, trying to see what uh, Miss Mitchell had written up there. And she noticed, Molly, are you okay? What's wrong? And she said something to my parents about it. And then in short order, I was fitted for glasses. And suddenly I could see. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our corrective lenses. What we read about Jesus is like being in that chair at the optometrist asking us, is this better or is this better? Now, now. Sometimes what the gospel clarifies for us is how far off the path we have wandered. But even in the midst of that discovery, finding out we're out there in the tall weeds, the gospel's clarity also shows us the path to get back. The trick, once our vision has been cleared, is to decide whether we prefer to be lost in our stubbornness or to acknowledge that Jesus knows the way better than we do and to trust and follow him. On Monday this last week, when I sent Linda the bulletin information, I intended to concentrate on Jesus' baptism as a sign of starting over, starting fresh. With the turn of the year and the new administration coming the white, into the White House, it seemed appropriate. Let's begin again. 
Jesus' baptism is a visible way God incarnate said to us, let's try this covenant relationship this way. After what we witnessed on Wednesday, I think it's still important to continue with this idea of starting over, to see how God came to us in human form to claim us as God's own. When God came in human form to say, let's start again, there were some things that were in store for Jesus that I think speak directly to what we saw on Wednesday. But let's look at the baptism itself as Mark records it. First of all, in Mark's gospel, this is the very first time Jesus shows up. There's no story, no backstory for him, nothing about his, his mother or his father or angels or shepherds or wise men or a mad king. No birth narrative, just Jesus of Nazareth comes to, the, to his cousin John in the wilderness in, near the Jordan. We don't have any dialogue in Mark's gospel between Jesus and John trying to explain why Jesus is submitting to baptism. He just gets in the water and goes under. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now remember, repentance doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I feel so bad about what I did, although there is some of that in there. Baptism is literally a turning away, a changing of one's mind, redirecting one's path, putting on corrective lenses. Maybe for Jesus, this meant in choosing this baptism that he was choosing to direct himself more fully toward God and the Spirit and their calling on his life. Now, we have no idea what Jesus' life was like between the stories of his younger years and his appearance at the Jordan. It's possible that he had heard his cousin was drawing large crowds of people out of Jerusalem, and he came to see what was going on. What are you doing, John? How are you getting all of these people to leave the city and come to you out here in the wilderness? Some people have suggested that he was following his cousin's ministry, and that's why he was there at the time. However, he gets out there to the wilderness. While he's there, he sees the people who have come. All the people. He saw them. And maybe he decided... In watching those people come to John, go into the river, go down into the water, and then come back up, he decided that if he was going to have any type of connection with them, then he needed to do as they did. He showed up in the wilderness, and he submitted to John's baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which places him alongside sinners and broken people. Us. So John was drawing the crowds away from the center of their world. He was asking them to repent, change your path, change your mind, and receive baptism in the wilderness. Leave what's familiar, leave what's comfortable, and make a decision to live differently and make it mean something by going to a place that's a little different, maybe a little unstable, with no amenities, and no guarantees. Instead of holding himself apart, instead of protecting himself and any idea of what his mission might be, Jesus stepped into that same water in which we stand and he wedded his reputation and his destiny to ours. In his baptism, Jesus entered into the full messy, messy living of the human family. This might explain why when he came up out of the water, the heavens split open, the spirit descended, and a voice came to him. Jesus, the incarnate word of God, had decided for us, and heaven responded. 
the first thing to happen was that the heavens tore open. Now, the word in Greek uh, that the NRSV translates as torn open, the, the Greek word is schizo. Does that sound familiar? In English, we get the words schizophrenia, which is a painful, um, uh, disruptive mental condition, and schiz schism, that's how they pronounce it, schism, which is an abrupt, dramatic, and even painful division. Sort of speaks to our world these days, doesn't it? This word, schizo, appears again at the end of Mark's gospel when Jesus dies and the curtain in the temple is torn apart. By using this word in Jesus' baptism and in his death, Mark shows us that God will enter our world in amazingly abrupt ways sometimes. From that jagged hole in the heavens, the spirit that brooded above the waters at creation descended toward Jesus in the form of a dove. One of the commentaries that I read this week, and I forgot to make note of who said it, so I apologize for stealing your idea and not giving you credit, said that the dove doesn't just simply land on Jesus, though. It's the form of a dove. It appears to be a dove. The Greek phrase, eis auton, can be translated to say that the spirit descended and came into him. Jesus is infused with the spirit from God. A new reality burst into the world, descended on Jesus, who submitted to baptism and transformed everything. And then right at the end, a voice comes to Jesus. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Think how that must have been for Jesus because he grew up hearing the stories of how he came to be. His mother was suddenly pregnant. His father wasn't always sure about her story. People I'm sure talked behind their hands and there may have been some unfortunate circumstances with other children when they spoke about him in schoolyard terms. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus' future course is laid out in front of him then. He will be the servant of God, the one who will offer his life as sacrifice. Like Isaac, the beloved promised son, this is a promise that nothing, not even death can break. Now, I didn't read any further on into Mark's gospel, but if you do so later, you'll see that right after Jesus sees and hears these things, I mean, the very next verse, he doesn't get a chance to bask in God's love and affirmation. In the very next verse, he's thrown out into the wilderness, into the realm of death and evil alone, where he's tempted for 40 days. And of course, we have to say, why? Because God did not send God's beloved son into this world to be nice. Jesus' baptism showed that Jesus' baptism showed God that he, Jesus, was ready to deal with evil. God was in Christ to reconcile the world to himself, and for that very reason, Task number one was to engage the evil that holds our world captive. Now there's an interesting thing. If we continue to read on to the Gospel of Mark or any of the other Gospels in the stories of Jesus, in his life something happened again and again and again. When he touched the sick, they got well. When he touched the unclean, they were cleansed. Jesus reversed 
conventional wisdom of his day that said it's sickness that gets transferred from the sick to the healthy. Jesus went the other way and he let his health flow into those who were sick. Jesus reached out to the sick because he knew that the contagion of God's spirit with which he had been anointed was stronger than the contagion of any sin. This is how we will live through what's coming, I think. This is how we should always live, to be a witness to the power of God at work in Jesus Christ and the Spirit at work in us. Witnesses that the contagion of the Spirit, the contagion of health and wholeness, is bigger and more powerful than anything we can get ourselves mired in. We have witnesses of that from just this week. I don't know if any of you are, are, uh, saw this story, and I can't remember where I saw it. Somebody linked to it at Facebook, and I went and I read the story, and I, again, forgot to uh, include the citation. But it was a story about Rear Admiral Margaret Kibben, who is the brand new <laughs> chaplain to the U.S. House of Representatives. I mean, I, th I think Wednesday was her very first day at work. Talk about a first day at work, I think. It may have been the second, I don't know. Anyway, uh, somebody asked her after, she, she went on in this, this, this uh, article uh, to talk about her experience in the Capitol on Wednesday, uh, what, what happened, uh, where she went and what she did. And what she did was embody Jesus for the people around her, for the representatives and the staff people who were terrified, who had no idea what was going on and who, when they heard the sounds of the crowds, were fearful for their lives. And she was asked in this interview, toward the end of the interview, why do you do this work? And she said, it's important because our daily lives are not separate from God's involvement in them. God is very much present and very much has come alongside each and every one of us as we labor in the vineyard. And if that labor is tedious, God understands the tedium. If the labor is under siege, God understands the crisis and walks beside us in still waters, as well as in the shadow of danger. We're not done with upheaval and division, either in the next coming weeks or in the months to come or in the years to come. Wednesday showed we have come to a reckoning. There is still more contagion to overcome with Jesus' grace and mercy. This is a time of purging and reckoning who we are, who we claim to be, and what we will tolerate. My hope and my prayer is that we don't shy away from this. We look clearly at what has happened, where we have been, how we got here, and where we will go. And I hope that the first step is truth and then reconciliation. Bishop Desmond Tutu said, true reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It's a risky undertaking, but in the end, it is worthwhile because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Jesus came up out of the water, was thrown into the wilderness to confront evil and then spent the rest of his life on earth, spreading the contagion of God's grace and mercy until the time when evil tried to overtake him thought it had won and was surprised on the third day. In his baptism, hearing that God is well pleased, Jesus showed himself capable and was made ready to confront our reality and bring healing. In our baptism in his name, like Rear Admiral Kibben and Bishop Tutu, we declare ourselves ready 
to do the same with this. God is well pleased. Thanks be to God for the gift we have been given in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I have to commend Linda for her choices of hymns this week. She picked them before she knew what was going to be happening. And they're perfect. So thank you, Linda. The second hymn is My Faith Looks Up to Thee. I have a couple of different prayers to offer today. Um, I'm, we're basing my prayers on a couple of different prayers. One from uh, Neil D. Pressa, who is the past moderator of the 220th General Assembly and uh, who is on the board of the Presbyterian Foundation. And the other one is from uh, Roger Gench, um, who is the current acting editor of Presbyterian Outlook. So I will be using their words and adapting it as we go along. So my friends, let us come before the throne of God's grace with humble hearts, knowing that our Lord hears us as we pray. Loving God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for the story of Jesus' baptism by John in the wilderness. For it reminds us of our own baptism. Just as you claimed Jesus as your beloved, so also we have been claimed as your own children, beloved. We remember before you all those who have been baptized in this fellowship of believers. Help us remember as a congregation the promises we made to each other in those baptisms to nurture them in their lives of faith. And Lord, help us remember our own baptism daily. Our baptism reminds us that the water of baptism is the true center of our cosmos. It's the place where we are called to live as your beloved people in a covenant relationship with you where you are our God and we are your people with one another and with your creation. Help us remember that declaration and that promise, promise, especially 
in times like these. Amid a pandemic that's devastating lives and communities, amid exposure of how racism is still wreaking its havoc in our nation, amid painful polarization and division, we claim our center, your center, in the baptism promise of love. Empower us to live out that love in all that we do, reaching out to heal divisions, address enmity, reaching out especially to those we perceive as enemies who are in reality your children. God of all nations, we pray for elected officials in our country and in countries around the globe, for those who have been entrusted to exercise leadership on behalf of the common good. Help them to discern wise use of resources to address needs of citizens suffering from the pandemic and its grave economic strains. And move us all to hear the cries of the marginal, the forgotten in our midst. Those who might be crying out as the prophet Habakkuk, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. O Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. And in wrath, may you remember mercy. Holy and righteous God, our nation is simmering with violence, boiling over with anger, and exploding in destructive words and deeds. Lord, hear our cry. Lord, plead our cause for justice. Help us as a nation and as a body of believers to reckon with the truth, past sins that feed present tense iniquity and that fuel future transgressions. Forgive our politics. Forgive our complicity. Give us Jesus-sized wills and Holy Spirit power to pray for our enemies, foreign and domestic, and to love neighbor and stranger because we know God of our salvation, left on our own, we cannot do it. Gird us with strong knees to kneel in fervent prayer, courageous hands and feet to challenge pharaohs and Caesars who seek to subvert your love and the ways of your kingdom, and humble hearts confident in your providence that creates a beloved community from stone and rubble of fallen empire, nation, and systems. Restrain evil and violence in a way that only you can, Almighty God. Intervene, Lord. Intrude into the world. Schizo into this world so that your justice will run like water and your righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Grant us wisdom to discern your way, Holy Spirit. Grant us courage to speak your word of truth. Grant us your guiding light and be a shepherd for us. We pray for our country. We pray that we will find God's presence everywhere we turn. We pray for the people on the front line. As we saw Wednesday, the people on the front line are hard pressed. And so gracious God, be with our law enforcement officers and those who tell them where to go and when. 
Be with the people who were not prepared this Wednesday. Be with the people who sat on their hands. Be with the people who cried out for help. Be with the people that we saw bludgeoned. Be with the people and the families of the people that died. Be with the people who are working in hospitals. Be with the people who are continuing to care for folks who have been diagnosed with the COVID and be with the people that we know and love who are suffering from it. For those who have not yet had it, gracious God, we pray your spirit of protection to continue to surround them, keep them healthy, keep them safe. We pray for the companies that are continuing to produce vaccines that we hope will be a beacon of getting over this and getting beyond it. We pray for government officials who are looking to provide resources that we've not had yet. And gracious God, we pray for young people and for children who are witnessing what is happening, who are growing up in this country and in this world that seems to have gone insane. We pray for clear vision for them and for our witness to be strong. You are not dead. You are not gone. You are indeed right beside us. And if we can hear, if we choose to hear, we will hear you calling us out of it into a future of reckoning and reconciliation. Hear these prayers that I have spoken, Lord God. Hear these prayers that I have read that other people have written. And hear now these, the prayers in the hearts of your people as we lift them up before you in silence. These are prayers we bring to you, almighty God, in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us that when we pray together, we say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in our baptism, we are claimed by the God of mercy and grace, dead to sin and alive to all that is possible. The God of heaven and earth calls us to come with humble hearts, bringing our very selves as an offering. Friends, how can you bring yourself? How can you offer yourself today, this week, in the coming days as an offering to the God who claimed you? How can you give? As you ponder that, how you will do that, let us dedicate that giving by singing together the doxology and then praying together the prayer of dedication. First, 
the doxology. Let us pray together. God, our Father, by your Spirit, confirm in our hearts the witness that Jesus is the Savior of the world and our Lord. Accept all that we have and all that we are in service to Jesus Christ. Strengthen us through your Spirit, and may our giving bless others as you have blessed us. Amen. Our final hymn is I Am Thine, O Lord. I'm going to, as a charge, um, or actually right before the charge, I'm going to share a little bit from the brief statement of faith, the part in the brief statement of faith about the Holy Spirit. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ. The church. The same spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, 
claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. This is who the Spirit is. This is what the Spirit did with Jesus. This is what the Spirit can do with us. And now, my friends, go out into this world as you are able in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one, evil for evil, but support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit to do those things and so very much more. And may the of the God who created you, the peace of the God who redeemed you, and the strength of the God who sustains you be with you now, this day, and always. Go with God, my friends. Go in peace. Amen. Please greet one another with the words of the ancient church. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen.